Something you commonly hear if you're a patient and you're just about to go under anesthesia might be something like, okay, you're going to go off to sleep now. If you take seriously what your anesthesiologist just said to you, you might like, well, whoa, I thought I was having anesthesia, I'm going to sleep, like what is this? You know, is this, is this, is this, is anesthesia just sleep? If sleep were anesthesia, or if anesthesia were sleep, I should say, then taking care of a patient under surgery would be very easy. We would just wait till they fell off to sleep and we would just roll them down to the operating room and operate on them. And we certainly don't do that. What anesthesia really is, is a coma. It's a drug-induced, reversible coma that has these four components. You're unconscious, you don't feel pain, you're not moving, and you form no memory about what's going on during the time that you're under the anesthesia. And we keep you physiologically stable. Right? So that is the definition of anesthesia. And it has to be a coma. You have to be insensate because what's going to happen to you if you're going to have like a limb repaired or if you're going to have your appendix removed or maybe your gallbladder removed or surgery on your heart or on your lung is you have to be in a situation where you're unable to perceive pain and not have any memories because that would be quite traumatic. So you need to be in a coma-like state, but it's reversible. It's a drug-induced, controlled, reversible coma. Sleep, on the other hand, is entirely different. Sleep is a physiological phenomenon. We spend roughly a third of our lives asleep. If we have sort of normal day-night cycles, we sleep at night and we, we're awake during the day. And if you look at sleep and you look at anesthesia, the best way to understand the differences between the two is by looking at the electroencephalogram. So sleep is comprised of two states, one which is called rapid eye movement sleep, the other is non-rapid eye movement sleep. So the EEG begins to slow a little bit, EEG meaning electroencephalogram, your brain waves start to slow a little bit, and you go through a series of stages which are defined by EEG patterns. There's stage one, non-REM sleep, stage two, and stage three. And you can tell the stage that the person is in based on the EEG patterns. So then, after going through the three stages of non-REM sleep, you then pop into REM sleep. So through the course of the night, you go non-REM, REM, non-REM, REM, in a cycle that alternates about every 90 minutes. What are the stages like? So each one has a roughly characteristic signature. And I'll just talk a little bit about stage two and three. So stage two has these things called spindles. They look like little oscillations that are about nine to 15 cycles per second. And then stage three, or slow wave sleep, has these slow waves, which are about one to two cycles per second, maybe up to about four cycles per second. You go into the state with the spindles and the slow waves, and you have just pure slow waves, then you go from there into REM sleep. Now, the EEG under REM sleep is very active. You have rapid eye movements, you have like decreased muscle tone, you have vivid dreams typically during REM sleep, and the physiology, the heart rate, blood pressure might be a little bit more irregular. In contrast, during non-REM sleep, you have sort of more muscle tone, you actually have a more regular heart rate and breathing pattern. And what's interesting is you can dream during non-REM sleep also, but you sleepwalk, you you sleepwalk during non-REM sleep. You don't sleepwalk during REM sleep. Because here's the way to think about it. During REM sleep, you actually have an active brain and a relaxed or, or paralyzed body. During non-REM sleep, you actually have sort of preserved muscle tone. So you go through these various physiologic states. Now, why do we do this? We think that what sleep does, it allows us to reconstitute it allows us to help form memories, to help consolidate memories that we form during the day. And it helps, us to, it helps us to learn. And it might be very important for maybe even reconstituting our immune system so we can fight off infections. So that's a physiologic condition. Anesthesia is entirely different. Based on the type of surgery that, we need, that you need, we actually give you a series of drugs that actually holds you in a fixed drug-induced state for as long as necessary for the surgeon 
to complete the surgical procedure that, you know, he or she is undertaking. So that's completely different. I mean, so one is like you're being held in a state here for a surgical procedure, and the other case, you're actually naturally oscillating, naturally fluctuating between two different, two different conditions. So sleep and anesthesia are, are quite different. Now, you might say, well, okay, could taking an anesthetic drug induce a state which is like sleep? I mean, that's a fair question because we take medications all the time to help us sleep. In fact, sleeping medications are some of the most widely sold over-the-counter drugs. Well, first of all, think about it. Sleep is this. It's oscillating between REM and non-REM sleep. Now, no drug, no single drug can cause you to naturally oscillate. So when you take sleeping medication, when someone takes a sleeping medication, what's actually happening? The sleeping medication is maybe reducing your arousal level, perhaps induce, reducing anxiety. And what it allows you, and what you're hoping for is that maybe then your natural sleeping tendencies, or your natural sleeping mechanisms will take over. Right? In the case of anesthesia and sleep medications, if you look at them, they work very much through the same mechanisms. In case of like the benzodiazepines through these GABA-A receptors, that's the same mechanisms through which propofol works. But propofol is much more powerful. When you give a sedative dose of propofol, you will stay with these very regular oscillations just like this, right? Your brain will not go in through the normal sleeping pattern oscillations if I maintained like an infusion of propofol here like this. So in other words, the anesthetic drug does not allow you, if it's maintained in an infusion like that, does not allow you to go into the normal cycling that's necessary to have sleep. So in that sense, the drugs that we use to produce anesthesia and the way we administer them would not create a state that would allow you to sleep. Having said that, we do have one of our anesthetics that creates patterns and works roughly similarly to the way natural sleep occurs, and that's dexmedetomidine. It does produce these spindles like I mentioned in slow-wave sleep, in, excuse me, stage two sleep, stage two non-REM sleep, and it also produces slow waves. But those are, again, pharmacologically induced. You don't then have the natural oscillation between non-REM sleep and REM sleep. So in essence, one way to think about it is anesthesia, the drugs are administered, they hold you in a fixed state here, when you sleep, you oscillate naturally between two well-defined conditions, and this is a physiologic oscillation. It's not, it's not drug-induced. It's not drug-controlled. Now, having explained the difference between sleep and anesthesia, um, let's think about the Michael Jackson case. What we know is that Michael Jackson was administered propofol, supposedly, in order to help him sleep. Well, if you think about what I just said, that at best, all he's getting is some type of sedation. And it's very likely that having gotten sedation and not being able to go through the normal cycling between the REM and non-REM states, he most likely deprived himself of sleep during, those, during the time that he was actually taking propofol or he was being administered propofol as opposed to getting, getting real sleep or getting restful sleep. There were reports that when this occurred, he would still wake up and feel refreshed. So how could this be? You know, what's really occurring? That's kind of a little, seemingly like a, a bit of a conundrum. Well, one of the things that happens is drugs act in many different parts of the brain. Propofol acts in the parts of the brain that help turn the brain off at the inhibitory neurons, but it also works in our pleasure centers where we release dopamine, which is one of our neurotransmitters associated with feeling good and having rewards. And what propofol does is it actually induces release of dopamine. So one plausible explanation for why he might have seemingly felt good after having had propofol is that he was feeling the kind of good feeling or euphoria that you get from the dopamine release that's associated with it. When in point of fact, as opposed to having had restful sleep, he, was, he might have most likely been sleep deprived. Why is it important to think about the differences or the similarities in some cases between sleep and anesthesia? Well, it's important because one of the things that we've learned from our research is that part of the way that propofol, which is one of the, you know, this widely used anesthetic works, is by inactivating 
the sleep circuits to help that contributes to the unconsciousness that it produces. So once you see that, you could start asking questions like, oh, well, hmm, could it be possible to either do this in a way such which is more like sleep, or could it be, is there a way that we could do this so that we could, so more like sleep and have profound unconsciousness would be useful for surgery, or more like sleep so that we could have sleep medication, sleeping medications that actually allowed you to have restful sleep. So getting at this distinction or and or similarities between anesthesia and sleep has profound and far-reaching implications for basic science as well as clinical medicine. <music>